Greetings. Welcome to Vedic Perspective. I'm your host, Ralph Lorino. So what I thought we would do is take a look at the lessons from the introduction to the Bhagavad Gita as it is. The premise being that there is a Vedic tradition of summary. In other words, for example, Srila Vyasadev, he's called Mahamuni. He is known as Vyasadev because he has compiled so many Shastras. So Vyasadev realized that in the age of Kali, the age in which we currently reside, that it would be very difficult for people to read the entire Vedas and let alone understand them. So he divided the Vedas into four divisions, the Sama, Rig, Yajra, and Atarva Vedas. Then he expanded the Vedas into 18 Puranas and has summarized Vedic knowledge in the Vedanta Sutra. So here we have an attempt by the Vedic masters to make things easier for us to understand Vedic knowledge, especially in the form of a summary study because in the age of Kali we just don't have the brain substance to really go through all the Vedas let alone understand all the Vedas. Uh, Srila Vyasadeva also compiled the Mahabharata which is accepted as the fifth Veda. Bhagavad Gita is contained within the Mahabharata. Also we have the example of the Vedanta Sutra being the codes a code form of the Vedas, but then there's also the commentary on the Vedanta Sutra, which is the Srimad Bhagavatam. So my belief is that, and we can test this, that the introduction to the Bhagavad Gita as it is by Srila Prabhupada is in the Vedic tradition of a summary study. And if we just read the introduction, we can get a general overview of the basic spiritual principles that we need to know in order to navigate through the rest of the teachings. So I'm going to go through it. I'm going to go through it point by point and we're going to try to see what exactly the eternal spiritual lessons that we can derive from the introduction to the Bhagavad Gita as it is. So here we go. All right, let's start here. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gnanjana Salakaya Chakshur Ummilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobishtam Shtapitam Yena Bhutale Svayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Sva Padantikam I was born in the darkest of ignorance and my spiritual master opened my eyes with the torch of knowledge. I offer my respectful obeisances unto him. When will Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada, who has established within this material world the mission to fulfill the desire of Lord Chaitanya, give me shelter under his lotus feet? So right off the bat here, this is pretty much the most important teaching in the Vedic literature. And a person could actually speak on this if he really wanted to, probably for days. The main point being that we're born in ignorance. So we see now with the New Age and with the explosion of YouTube that there's this philosophy, this outlook that actually everything's inside of you. And if you just look inside of you, then you will be able to discover the absolute truth. Now this is in direct contrast to the Vedic version. Now, I'm not trying to force anybody to accept the Vedas or to accept this teaching. I'm actually doing this more for my own personal edification. Of course, I'm so grateful to the people who listen and want to come on the journey with me. Um, I'm trying to get a deeper understanding of what's happening uh, according to the Vedas and to try to give that perspective to people from my own viewpoint in terms that, you know, it's kind of a personal story. It's, and I think people might be able to relate to a, a personal story of what a person is, who spent a lifetime studying these things. What are, what are the stages you go through? What are the realizations? How we can 
combine into a community of people who are researching these things. Be that as it may, we see that the rampant philosophy of today is that you don't need a teacher. Of course, the person telling you this is, t is trying to teach you something, but you know, it's a serious contradiction that I wouldn't need anyone to tell if all truth were inside me. I wouldn't even need someone to tell me that I don't need a teacher because I would realize that on my own. And you'll see often people, whether they're New Age or the modern day YouTube guru, uh, there's so many different types of YouTube gurus, but um, they tell you that you don't need a teacher, but yet they immediately take the role of a teacher. So that's a serious contradiction. And we can see in just practical matters of everyday life that a teacher is required. Sometimes you hear stories, I don't know if they're true or not, of people who, but we can kind of understand that people are raised in isolation and they come out almost like an animal. In other words, if they don't have any human contact in terms of transmitting culture and transmitting the translating the basic skills of life such as reading, writing, um, understanding different concepts, that the person is animal-like. So even in the most mundane things about in life, we need a teacher. Even how to interact with each other, how to speak, how to write. So the practical example is that for every sphere of life, it requires a teacher. So when we step into the world of spiritual knowledge and desiring for something more in life, as in, in terms of a deeper understanding of our place and our place in the universe and who and what we are, now all of a sudden we don't need a teacher? No, that's not in agreement with the Vedic literature. So I'm going to say here, that if anyone tells you that you do not need a teacher, of course while taking the role of a teacher, that person is not a bona fide source of knowledge. So this is a very important, the first point is, an, is probably the most important point, that we're born into ignorance, and we used to say sometimes my spiritual master forcibly opened my eyes with the torch of knowledge. So this is where I think personal experience can come into it. I mean, I agree with that, that even after you come across spiritual knowledge, especially bon when you come across bona fide spiritual knowledge, the tendency is you want to go back to sleep for a while, just like when we wake up in the morning. You know, usually not everyone just pops up out of bed. You know, the tendency is you want to go back to sleep for a while. You'd like to, you know, it's kind of like a momentum. So... Um, spiritual life can be like that, when we, especially when we first step in, the tendency is to want to reject it. Because, too, it's reasonable in the sense that there's a lot of consequences that may not be materially the most beneficial once you step into spiritual life. So there's fear. Sometimes there can be fear. There can be concern about the future, what that will hold, especially because it's usually in contrast to the uh, almost exclusive material, materialistic out, outlook we've been given in the West. Um, so yeah, it's an important point. Another thing that I've noticed uh, in the YouTube world, especially in the world, we'll call it um, alternative knowledge, alternative history, alternative cosmology. There's a lot of people using Prabhupada's books. There's even some people who are basically giving direct lectures, especially in the astrotheology realm. I'll just leave it at that for now. They're using pr the pictures from Prabhupada's books. They're using the words from Prabhupada's books. And nobody is giving credit to Prabhupada. It's actually unbelievable. This is not scholarship. Scholarship is, is basically an understanding that you're, you're building on what's come before. So anytime you do a scholarly work, you have to footnote it. You have to give the citations of, what, uh, of the different propositions that you're making, and perhaps you're building on those, and that's your, that's your uh, gift but that you're trying to give. 
but all knowledge is built upon previous knowledge so whenever we see people talking about these things and they refuse to give citations as to where the knowledge is coming from and where they're getting the ideas from even if now they're giving their own personal spin on it it's not scholarly it can't be taken seriously so I think that these are the some very important points that we need someone to help us understand the path um, of course now because everything good is given a bad name basically nowadays you know this word guru has become like sort of this toxic word where you know if you accept someone as a guru then basically you're in a cult and you're mind controlled when we see that obviously the society at large that's where the mind control is going on through the television now the the cell phone I you know we can walk around and see that you know cell phone addiction is a serious problem that the illusion there is that I'm in control of the technology but obviously the technology is in control of us so um, you know we have to break through these illusions and especially if we're questing for knowledge so there's warning signs if we're on the wrong path if someone that we're accepting as a bona fide source of knowledge is telling us that no teacher or guru is required that can't be a bona fide source of knowledge if they're basically using other people's work and not citing it that person is a cheater they're cheating because why they want to be the guru that's the main they want to be the spiritual teacher they want to take that role it's more seducing than practically any other type of corruption in that even money women or the opposite sex the, somehow the position of being a teacher and controlling other people that is a very heavy intoxicant and we see that it's just gone rampant so when you're on your path at least according to the Vedic perspective that if people are saying that you do not need a teacher a bona fide teacher and if they're saying and uh, if they're not giving credit to where the knowledge is coming from that they're building on that person should automatically be rejected okay so the first lesson was an important lesson and I really apologize for my Sanskrit I, uh, Bengali pronunciations of these different things but we're gonna keep going oh also also this part when will Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada was established within the material world the mission to fulfill the desire of Lord Chaitanya give me shelter under his lotus feet now we see too nowadays it's a big thing that to reject Christ because it was 2,000 years ago so in the fog of time it's so easy to say that oh Jesus Christ didn't exist and it was all some type of conspiracy and all these things so this is one reason that the Vedic literature is often there's an intense effort to cover the Vedic literature and to cover Prabhupada's teachings because we have a line of teachers that extends back into antiquity that is current up to the modern day for example Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada we have the teachings we have the books of Srila Rupa Goswami we have his Samadhi tomb we know where where he is laid to rest the same with Lord Chaitanya we, these things only happened 500 years ago and of course their students who then became masters you know up to the up to Srila Prabhupada and that's where it ends at Srila Prabhupada that's where it ends for right now for a long time and we can see there's a lot of cheating that's gone on um, post uh, the anyway we've seen that there's a lot of cheating that goes on but we're gonna we're taking it we're, we're, we're leaving it up to Prabhupada to guide us on this mission so there's a big so this is another important point here why why the big cover-up of the Vedas why is no one willing to say all these researchers into alternative theories why, why are they unwilling to say where the knowledge is coming from now let me give you a personal example of this um, when the uh, whole flat earth alternative cosmology thing got started the very first video that was done by Eric Dubay basically used the work of Sadaput, Richard L. Thompson, 
and um, the Bhak in the days of the Bhaktivedanta Institute. They basically used his animation in Mysteries of the Sacred Universe, his uh, book and video, Mysteries of the Sacred Universe. And still to this day, you see it all the time in alternative cosmology videos that they're using the work of Richard L. Thompson, Sadhuput Das, who was studied so closely with Prabhupada and was trying to make a breakthrough in getting the Vedic perspective to be viewed along as a scientific, a perfectly valid scientific way of looking at the world. Um, he was groundbreaker in that, in terms of archaeology, cosmology, and not one person has ever given him credit, even though the video that started the whole thing of alternative cosmology, I don't know if it still exists, I've looked for it, um, I don't know if it's been taken down, or, you know, because I've criticized this before, um, But that first video that kicked off the whole thing was basically Richard L. Thompson and Sadhuputas' work. But no one ever gives him credit for all this. So that's just one point, you know, of how these things are being covered up and co-opted. And how then people, rather than admitting that they're getting knowledge from elsewhere, at least in terms of, you know, alternative ideas, that uh, they just don't want to give credit. Why? Because the desire... To be the center, the desire to be seen as the guru is really, really powerful. It's one of the most powerful inducements you can get in this world because a lot of people know they're not ever going to see millions upon millions of dollars. A lot of people know they're never going to be uh, in control the way the elites are in control nowadays. But what you can do, you can be a guru for a small number of people and ha and have them. And that's another thing that really bothers me too is that Sometimes you'll go on to a channel and a person is speaking something that's just slightly alternative. And uh, everyone is praising them like, you know, as if they're some kind of God. And no one ever says, please don't praise me like that. You know, it never ends in anything good. We, we, you know, when it becomes like there's there's a person that, you know, is being praised. Re meanwhile, they're not citing where the scholarship comes from. They're acting like all the ideas are completely come up in their own head, even though I can prove time and again that they're practically reading out of Prabhupada's books. They're using the work of Sadaput. You know, it, it's, it's not going to end anywhere that's profitable for the real student of spiritual knowledge. So the two main points here, as we get only a few few lines into it, Teacher is required in order to help us, guide us on the path. As in every other field of study and every other field of life, teacher is required. Secondly, the reason why the cover-up of the Vedic knowledge is so strong is that because it's up to the current date, there's no way anybody's going to be able to say Rupa Goswami didn't exist, and Sanatan Goswami didn't exist, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu didn't exist, and Prabhupada. Didn't. Even, even I've actually heard these things sometimes that they didn't. But you know, it's completely the talk of a madman because there's so much evidence, so many books that they've left behind. So two important points there. Okay, let's keep going. At least we'll we'll get through the first page here and uh, find out what the next lesson is. Vandeham Sri Guru Sri Yukta Pada Kamalam Sri Gurun Vaishnavam Cha Sri Rupam Sangratjatam Sahagana Ragunatan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishaka Vitamscha. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of my spiritual master and unto the feet of all Vaishnavas. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of Srila Rupa Goswami, along with his elder brother Sanatan Goswami, as well as Raghunath Das and Raghunath Bhatta, Gopal Bhatta, and Srila Jiva Goswami. I offer my respectful obeisances to Lord Krishna Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda along with Advaita Acharya. 
Gadadhar, Sri Vas, and other associates. I offer my respectful obeisances to Sri Mati Radharani and Sri Krishna, along with their associates Sri Lalita and Vishaka. Okay, important lessons here. The main important lesson here is that there's a line of teachers. And this, these teachers go all the way back to Sri Krishna himself. Also, a very important point here is that in the ultimate issue, you know, one thing nowadays with the uh, radical feminism and all this, they're always looking to, uh, they're always looking to dis the man or the masculine or God in some way because in Western culture, God is seen as a masculine figure. So we have to understand in the Vedic conception, there's Radha and Krishna. There's female and male. And it's not that there's one person that embodies the ideals of male and female. There's two separate beings. The Supreme Personality of a Godhead. That's why it's called Godhead. Because there's more than one. There's Radha. There's Krishna. There's female and there's male. And by their union, they create. So the example is often given an example for the, the powerhouse and the transmission lines. That the powerhouse on its own, we could we could say Krishna is like the powerhouse on its own, is meaningless. There has to be the transmission lines that distribute the energy, and that's Radharani. So also they have associates like Sri Lalita and Vishaka. So this gives us an, an idea of what the spiritual world is really like. It's personal. It's not impersonal. Because who really wants to just remain in a white light for eternity or to do some... It, it's almost the conception in Christianity, which I don't believe is the real conception. It, it may be an abbreviated conception because the people at the time, may, may that's all they may have been ready for. But this idea of kind of being in some kind of static state, a st steady state for eternity, I think that's not appealing to people. But if we realize that the spiritual world is full of variety, full of relationships, full of adventure, full of love, full of caring, full of eternity, full of bliss, full of knowledge, and we're not just hanging in a white light eternally, you know, that's really where it's at. So that's the lessons here, is that there's a line of teachers that extends back all the way to the source. They're current up to the day. We have nothing but proof for it. And, and this idea, too, for the atheists, like somehow if they defeat, like Christian theology really isn't the greatest nowadays. I don't know what happened exactly to it. Maybe it got involved in politics or but Christian theology is not really complete right now. It's actually kind of easy to defeat sometimes if you don't understand it in the context of the Vedas. But the idea of the atheist that by defeating false Christian theology, and I'm not saying there's not real Christian theology, I just don't think people know how to present it properly anymore. But somehow by defeating false Christian theology, you've defeated all the different concepts and outlooks of God. No, you've defeated some people who are weak in theology that is absolutely not proof that there is no God. And if that is the standard, that if you defeat someone in a, theologically, and then you would have to go to every different religion around the world and every different religious outlook in the world and defeat them as well, which you can't do because there's too many. So the idea of atheists that if they don't like Christian theology or they feel like they can defeat Christian theology, that that's the end of the story? No, I don't think so. All right, we'll keep going. Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagat Pate Gopesh Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Oh my dear Krishna, you are the friend of the distressed and the source of creation. You are the master of the gopis and the lover of Radharani. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Okay, important lesson here. We're learning about the nature of God. You know, so this is 
let's say we didn't know anything about God or spiritual life or had been severely misled. So here we're starting to have our first introduction to the characteristics of God. He's the friend of the distressed and the source of creation. These are important points, especially in the Western conception sometimes. They portray, you know, the angry God, the vengeful God. There may be circumstances in which God may present himself that way to a group of people who need that or want that. As, you know, we can discuss later on, there are different relationships with God. But these these two qualities are the primary qualities of God. And if we're hearing something different, we have to, you know, kind of look a little deeper into it. That uh, it may not actually be God that they're talking about. But here are the two primary qualities of God. He's the friend of the distressed, and he's the source of creation. So the Big Bang is not the source of creation. If ever you heard anything more nonsensical than the Big Bang Theory, leave in the comments what you think that is, but I never. Maybe the theory of evolution might be something that is equally as absurd. But I've talked about that on other in depth in other videos, so we'll let that go for now. But the source of creation is God. Whether people like that or not, I, I don't know what to tell them. And the idea that, well, the Big Bang is the method by which God created, no. No, we're going to have, if we want to know the method of creation, we have to go to the creator, not some people speculating about the method of creation. So um, I think that is important. Also, we here see here, um, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. So this is an important point in spiritual knowledge as well. Prabhupada will talk about this further in, in the introduction. That the best way to go into this, and no one's going to force anybody to believe, as if you could force someone to believe something nowadays. And we're not really asking for belief. This is actually a system of evidence, Vedic evidence, evidence of hearing. That No one is going to force anybody to believe anything. But it's a good to at least theoretically accept the things as you go through so that your mind isn't constantly fighting against every every single word you know at least theoretically accept these things as we go and then at the end you can make a decision but fighting every step of the way because we've been taught to be atheistic is not really going to be profitable and at the end if you decide that you don't like it or don't want it or don't need it or only need part of it then that's your decision no one is trying to make anybody believe or accept anything. We're just trying to make the most solid case possible that the Vedas are a bona fide source of spiritual knowledge and that if we could understand them, we'd be a lot better off. Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrindavan Ishvari Rishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamani Hari Priya I offer my respect to Radharani, whose bodily complexion is like molten gold, and who is the queen of Vrindavan. You are the daughter of King Vrishabhanu. You are very dear to Lord Krishna. And, you know, any good, any good spiritual uh, body, any, you know, there has to be some really, this is nice poetry. I, I like this. This is good. You know, it, this this has to be a part of it that it's not all about some kind of, you know, people warring and moving and going here and going there and fighting and destroying each other as, you know, some kind of like, oh, this is what spiritual life is all about. You know, no. It's about beautiful poetry. It's about beautiful writing. And uh, there, there are many tales of adventure but there has to be that side to it, that beautiful side. Vanchakalpa Tarubyas Cha Kripa Sindhu Biebacha Patitanam Pavanabio Vaishnava Bio Namo Namaha. I offer my respectful obeisances unto all the Vaishnava devotees of the Lord who can fill the desires of everyone, just like desire trees, and who are full of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. So nowadays now that they've busted up the family and 
and done so many things to isolate people everybody's looking for a family and it's kind of easy to trick people if you start saying yeah our people or you know like people so much want to be a part of something because of our fractured culture that they're easily tricked but here's your real family is the family of devotees you have a family and it's not based on your race or skin color or political affiliation or your gender it's based on eternal principles of spiritual knowledge and the devotees are just like desire trees so that they can help you Sri Chaitan Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavrinda I offer my respectful obeisances to Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar, Sri Vas, and all others in the line of devotion. So, my proposition is that Sri Krishna Chaitanya is actually the second coming of Jesus Christ, that um, there's no need to wait any longer to admit it. So, the Hebrews, they were waiting for a Messiah. Then Jesus came, and you might say, well, you know, they rejected that Messiah. And so maybe after a hundred years, you might say, well, wait, we should maybe take a look at the Jesus guy uh, as the Messiah, or maybe 200. Now it's 2,000 years. They're still waiting for a Messiah. So at what point do you give in and say that, yeah, Jesus was the Messiah? We have to admit now, after 2,000 years, we're not prepared to wait 3,000 or 4,000 years for our so-called imaginary Messiah to come. So yeah, we're going to have to rethink that one. But no, it never happens. So the same thing with the Christians now. Jesus said he'd be back soon. And they're going to wait just as the Hebrews are waiting and waiting and waiting. Now the Christians will wait and wait and wait. And rather than you know, look to see the life and teachings and precepts of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as the second coming of Jesus Christ, they're just going to wait eternally for him to return. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So now Prabhupada gives you the Maha Mantra. O Krishna, O energy of Krishna, please engage me in your devotional service. So the idea of devotional service being the primary primary aspect of spiritual life that will give us tangible results. Uh, in other words, you know, as will be seen later in the Gita, the yoga of bhakti. So there's a lot. I mean, there's so many lessons. Now we're only into page two, but let's keep going. Bhagavad Gita is also known as Gita Upanishad. It is the essence of Vedic knowledge and is one of the most important Upanishads in the Vedic literature. Of course, there are many commentaries in English on the Bhagavad Gita. And one may question that necess the necessity for another one. This present edition can be explained in the following way. Recently, an American lady asked me to recommend an English translation of Bhagavad Gita. Of course, in America, there are so many editions of Bhagavad Gita available in English. But as far as I have seen, not only in America, but also in India, none of them can be strictly said to be authoritative, because in almost every one of them, the commentator has expressed his own opinions without touching the spirit of Bhagavad Gita as it is. Important lessons from this paragraph. I think... I think that the idea that there have been no authorized translations of the Bhagavad Gita as it is, there has been no tr authorized translations of the Bhagavad Gita is shocking, really, although completely believable. I mean, Prabhupada, he's the expert of the Bhagavad Gita. He is the ultimate authority on the Bhagavad Gita. That up until this point, especially for the English translation, now, of course, Many of the great acharyas have written uh, commentaries. Baladeva Jibhusan, Ramanujacharya have written 
commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita. But as far as the translating into English, no, no translator has hit the mark. They've all injected their own theories, their own viewpoints, so that we could never, in the English-speaking world, we can never actually touch on the actual meaning of the Bhagavad Gita before. So this is an extremely important work. For the first time in human history, English readers of the Bhagavad Gita can actually understand what it's all about without some misinterpretation. The spirit of Bhagavad Gita is mentioned in Bhagavad Gita itself. It is just like this. If we want to take a particular medicine, then we have to follow the directions written on the label. We cannot take the medicine according to our own whim or the direction of a friend. It must be taken according to the directions on the label or the directions given by a physician. Similarly, Bhagavad Gita should be taken or accepted as it is du directed by the speaker himself. The speaker of Bhagavad Gita is Lord Sri Krishna. He is mentioned on every page of Bhagavad Gita as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Bhagavan. Of course, the word Bhagavan sometimes referred to any powerful person or any powerful demigod. And certainly here, Bhagavan designates Lord Sri Krishna as a great personality. But at the same time, we should know that Lord Sri Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, as is confirmed by all the great Acharyas, spiritual masters, like Sankracharya, Ramanujacharya, Madhva Acharya, Nimbarka Swami, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and many other authorities of Vedic knowledge in India. The Lord Himself also establishes Himself as the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the Bhagavad Gita. And He is accepted as such in the Brahma Samhita and all the Puranas, especially the Srimad Bhagavatam, known as the Bhagavat Purana. Krishna is too Bhagavan Swayam. Therefore, we should take Bhagavad Gita as it is directed by the personality of Godhead himself. So important points in this paragraph and the lessons we can learn. That the spiritual master is like a physician. So we, we have to try to kick away the mind control theories of the Western civilization that makes us against teachers and that there is no bona fide teacher. The spiritual master's role is like that of a physician. He helps to understand what's troubling you. And in this case, the ultimate spiritual master is the Lord himself, Sri Krishna, understands what's troubling you. He writes a prescription for that. But then it's up to us to follow the prescription follow the directions so there's an element of free will involved that uh, no one is forcing anybody to do anything because what is the meaning of love then that's why I often feel like God is damned if he does and damned if he doesn't in other words people say oh why is there evil in the world and why does God allow these things to go on so if God created us as robots just to do his bidding and to act in ways that we have no control over, he would be damned. That well, what is the point of creating a bunch of useless robots running around, you know, doing all these things, but yet nobody is actually conscious? And then if he gives us consciousness and free will, and then we misuse that, then he's also condemned for that. So that doesn't make any sense. So the fact of the matter is we have limited free will to either follow the prescription given by the physician or to not follow the prescription given by the physician. So we, we, can't, we can't eternally blame God for our problems. But one thing that is for sure, that even when we misuse our free will and we create horrible situations such as war and famine and all these unnecessary things, that ultimately God will turn it into the good in the long run. Even though, you know, it's a, I can imagine it's a tough task sometimes to try to take, make something into good as to what people mess up with their free will. But yet, we, we, God will do that. He, otherwise, we wouldn't be here. We would not be here. If it was up to, completely up to people with all their wars and killing and bad food and bad water 
and pollution and mind control and so many, you know, we wouldn't be around. So God has somehow, we, Hegel called it the cunning of reason. In other words, if we look back over history, we see that, the, that even in the most dire situations where it looks like there's nothing but pure evil, that something good comes out of it in order to advance civilization. Again, we see the importance of the line of spiritual teachers and that when the spiritual teachers, the bona fide spiritual teachers are in agreement, then we know that we're in a secure and safe path. All right, let's move on. In the fourth chapter of the Gita, the Lord says, Imam vivasvate yogam proktavan aham avayayam Vivisvan manave praha manor iksvakave bravit evam prampra praptam imam rajarseo zidhu sa kalenheya mahatha yoga nashta parantapa sa evam maya te dya yoga prokta pura tana bakto si me sakacheti Rahasyam hi itad uttamam. Here the Lord informs Arjuna that the system of yoga, the Bhagavad Gita, was first spoken to the sun god, and the sun god explained it to Manu, and Manu explained it to Ikshvaku, and in that way, by disciplic succession, one speaker after another, this yoga system has been coming down, but in course of time it has become lost. Consequently, the Lord has to speak it again, this time to Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. So basically, that's what Prabhupada is saying about the meaning of the, of the translations of the Bhagavad Gita, that the meaning had been lost again. And that Prabhupada came to help restore the meaning of the Bhagavad Gita. Another thing is that it was supposed, for, the Bhagavad Gita was first spoken to the sun god, and this is something that really bothers me about today's modern conspiratorial nonsense, and that the rulers are sun worshippers. No, they're not. You know, anyone who is afraid of the sun god or thinks that the sun god is bad when he has a heavy task of keeping the whole universe illuminated and basically as we read further in the Vedas we'll find out that the sun god is the only the only uh, entity that is in charge of that is help part of the universal government or is in charge of universal affairs that is always an expansion of the supreme personality of Godhead. The sun god is always an avatar of the supreme personality of Godhead whereas other demigods may or may not be. So the sun god has a unique position in this world. I mean, he is the central focus of this world, and he is taking the light of the spiritual world and transforming it into this material world to give life to everything. So the 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 rulers of people, the rulers of this world, do not worship light; they worship darkness. And you see these these fanatical Christians just going off on people, you know, worshiping the sun god or having some connection to the sun. It's pure nonsense, really. It, you know, there's no, nothing to be afraid of in the sun god. As a matter of fact, he's an essential link in the chain of teachings coming down to mankind. So stop blaspheming the sun god along with God. He tells Arjuna that he's relating the supreme secret to him because he is a devotee and friend. The purport of this is that Bhagavad Gita is a treatise which is especially meant for the devotee of the Lord. There are three classes of transcendentalists, namely the jnani, the yogi, and the bhakta, or the impersonalist, the meditator, and the devotee. Here the Lord clearly tells Arjuna that he is making him the first receiver of a new parampara, the cyclic succession, because the old succession was broken. It was the Lord's wish, therefore, to establish another parampara in the same line of thought that was coming down from the sun god to others. 
and it was his wish that his teachings be distributed anew by Arjuna. He wanted Arjuna to become the authority in understanding Bhagavad Gita. So we see that Bhagavad Gita is instructed to Arjuna, especially because Arjuna was a devotee of the Lord, a direct student of Krishna, and his intimate friend. Therefore, Bhagavad Gita is best understood by a person who has qualities similar to Arjuna's. That is to say, he must be a devotee in a direct relationship with the Lord. As soon as one becomes a devotee of the Lord, he also has a direct relationship with the Lord. That is a very elaborate subject matter, but briefly, it can be stated that a devotee is in a relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead in one of five different ways. 1. One may be a devotee in a passive state. 2. One may be a devotee in an active state. 3. One may be a devotee as a friend. 4. One may be a devotee as a parent. 5. One may be a devotee as a conjugal lover. So I don't know. I mean, where is the other religion that this is stated so clearly? That what, what are the different relationships that we can have with the Supreme Personality of Godhead? Certainly, growing up in the Christian tradition, God is always seen as the parent, more or less. You know, there is, And it's not even spoken of that there could be another option. So again, this is maybe why so many people get turned off from religion because of the narrow view of certain religions. And I don't believe that it's actually inherent within those religions. But just as another important point, the disciplic succession can be broken. It's always reinstated, but it can be broken. So perhaps in other religions where these things are not known or things are presented in an unattractive way, that the disciplic succession is broken. And that it has to be reinstated. And that Prabhupada is actually, he's reinstating all the religions. Or all, all rather than religion, which is a mis another misunderstood term, we can, un we can call it all transcendental knowledge across the board, is being reinstated here. And we can see here, just look, there's five different ways that you can be related to God, at least, you know, we can understand these five pretty easily and actually some may be more attractive to some people than others so therefore that may interest them more to become involved in transcendental teachings if they don't feel like they're being suffocated Arjuna was in a relationship with the Lord as a friend of course there is a gulf of difference between this friendship and the friendship found in the material world this is transcendental friendship which cannot be had by everyone of course, everyone has a particular relationship with the Lord, and that relationship is evoked by the perfection of devotional service. But in the present status of our life, we have not only forgotten the Supreme Lord, but we have forgotten our eternal relationship with the Lord. Every living being out of many, many billions and trillions of living beings has a particular relationship with the Lord eternally. That is called Svarup. By the process of devotional service, one can revive that Svarup and that stage is called Svarup Siddhi, perfection of one's constitutional position. So Arjuna was a devotee, and he was touched, and he was in touch with the Supreme Lord in friendship. So although there's five categories of relationships with the Supreme Lord, here it's stated that each of us has a unique relationship with him. So just like, you know, there are so many fathers in the world, but their, each child has a unique relationship with their father. So it's not a, like a cookie cutter thing, whereas if you just follow certain rules and regulations, then somehow it's all going to work out. But no, it's actually a process of discovering your unique relationship with the Supreme Lord. So it's rather than being a system of tyrannical thought control, it's actually a system of discovery, of discovering relationships. And not only with the Supreme Lord, but with all the different devotees of the Lord and all the different literatures and, and so many things. So rather than being a tyranny, it's actually a freeing experience when you, just like, let's say a person doesn't know who their father is. And then they could get, then at some point they may be able to get to know that person. So it's something that's, 
that's a process of discovery and a process of improving ourselves. Okay, and we can understand too that Arjuna's Arjuna's uh, relationship with the Lord is in friendship. How Arjuna accepted this Bhagavad Gita should be noted. His manner of acceptance is given in the 10th chapter. Arjuna Uvacha Param Brahma Param Dhamma Pavitram Param Bhavam Purusham Shashvatam Divyam Adi Devam Ajam Vibhum Ahustvam Vijarsha Sarve Devarsir Naradas Tata Asito Devala Vyasa Svayam Chaiva Bravishame Sarvad Ite Ritam Manye Yan Mam Vadasi Keshava Nahite Bhagavan Victim Vidur Deva Na Dandava Arjuna said, You are the Supreme Brahman, the ultimate, the supreme abode and purifier the absolute truth and the eternal divine person. You are the primal God, transcendental and original, and you are the unborn and all-pervading beauty. All the great sages like Narada, Asita, Devala, and Vyas proclaim this of you, and now you yourself are declaring it to me. O Krishna, I totally accept this truth all that you have told me. Neither the gods nor demons, O Lord, know thy personality. Bhagavad Gita 10, chapter 10, verses 12 through 14. Here we can learn more about the qualities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And what always strikes me, too, is that even though modern literature is, is so puny and horrible, and yet they're willing to say that all these great masters of the past were somehow in some kind of horrible delusion that God existed, and they're writing all these volumes upon volumes of literature that is incomparable to today, today's trash literature. Um... So madmen who were in a delusion created the greatest works of art as far as literature, architecture, poetry, culture. That's not how it works. You know, great, the great, the great create great. So we have to accept it. This is a proof that these people, Narada, Asita, Devala, Vyas, they're all accepting Arjuna. Krishna as the Supreme Personality of God, it can't be brushed aside because of their creations. After hearing Bhagavad Gita from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Arjuna accepted Krishna as Param Brahma, the Supreme Brahman. Every living being is Brahman, but the Supreme Living Being, or the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is the Supreme Brahman. Param Dham means that he is the supreme rest or abode of everything. Pavitram means that he is pure, untainted by material contamination. Purusham means that he is the supreme enjoyer. Divyam, transcendental. Adi Devam, the supreme personality of Godhead. Ajam, the unborn. And Vibhum, the greatest and all pervading. This, this paragraph is giving us a look at the qualities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, I don't know, you can search through so many religions and sit through so much and, and not even get this understanding that is in this one paragraph of the nature of the Supreme Lord. Now, one may think that because Krishna was the friend of Arjuna, Arjuna was telling him all this by way of flattery. But Arjuna, just to drive out this kind of doubt from the minds of the readers of Bhagavad Gita, substantiates these praises in the next verse when he says that Krishna is accepted as the supreme authority, as the supreme personality of Godhead, not only by himself, but by authorities like the sage Narada, Asita, Devla, Vyasadev, and so on. These are great personalities who distribute the Vedic knowledge as it is accepted by all Acharyas. Therefore, Arjuna tells Krishna that he accepts whatever he says to be completely perfect. Saravam itad ritam manye. I accept everything you say to be true. Arjuna also says that the personality of the Lord is very difficult to understand, and that he cannot be known even by the great demigods. This means that the Lord cannot be known by personalities greater than human beings. 
So how can a human being understand Sri Krishna without becoming his devotee? So yeah, it's going to come down to this, that if you want to believe that all these people were wrong and all these people were delusional madmen, I guess that's your choice. But it's not so easy to just brush it all aside when we understand the, the, the great works that these people have done, the volumes of literature that they've, that they've compiled and distributed and written. You know, you have to make a choice at this point as to whether you believe that all the great masters of spiritual science throughout history were all completely delusional madmen or that they were correct. There's no middle ground. So as soon as the atheists come up with some literature that even can be one trillionth the, uh, the depth and the understanding, the beauty of religion, and we see all the great, throughout history, up until recent times, who had the recent times, we have nothing. Well, we have some skyscraper. But we could see throughout history, all great artistic works were spiritually or religiously based. The cathedrals of Europe, the great artworks of the past, all were had religious themes. And when people stopped believing in that, and when they, now look at what we have, it's like totally degraded. And people are just throwing some paint around and splattering it on canvas and they're calling that art. That's the, that's the degradation of art. But if we look back to when people believed and people knew beyond believing, you know, we have cathedrals and all these things that even to this day people are trying to figure out how did they do this. Culture is based on spirituality. Culture is not based on some degraded outlook on people and, and human life and what we're about and some nihilistic view that nothing is really important, that nothing is worth fighting for, that nothing is good. Show me the artwork that compares to the great masters of the past. Show me the literature that compares to the great masters of the past. Show me the buildings that compare to the great masters of the past. You've got nothing. Therefore, Bhagavad Gita should be taken up in a spirit of devotion. One should not think that he is equal to Krishna, nor should he think that Krishna is an ordinary personality or even a great personality. Lord Sri Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead, at least theoretically. According to the statements of Bhagavad Gita or the statements of Arjuna, the person who is trying to understand the Bhagavad Gita, we should therefore at least theoretically accept Sri Krishna as the supreme personality of Godhead. And with that submissive spirit, we can understand Bhagavad Gita. Unless one reads the Bhagavad Gita in a submissive spirit, it is very difficult to understand Bhagavad Gita because it is a great mystery. So I like this part. I like this verse. I like this paragraph that, at least theoretically, you know, let's set aside our prejudices for the time being. And at least theoretically, understand the statements of the Bhagavad Gita to be between the Supreme Lord and his most intimate friend and devotee, Arjuna. At least theoretically. No one's demanding anything of anybody that you... You accept this as your way of life, or this becomes your primary way of thinking about the world or interacting. No one's making any, any demands. But at least theoretically, for the time being, you know, let's go through the literature of the Bhagavad Gita in a submissive spirit. Oh, oh my God, that's another thing now. They, everything that's good, they make you hate. And they load down these words like guru and submissive spirit to mean something horrible and you know we have to be the proud American we have to you know and meanwhile everyone is under the thumb everyone is being controlled everybody is actually in the ultimate form of submission right now we don't have any control over the politics we have no control over the economy we have no control impulse control from moment to moment everybody gazing into their cell phone like some kind of robot but as soon as you say everyone is submissive in so many ways to so many things that are wrong but as soon as you say be submissive to the right thing at least theoretically 
<laughs> then everyone is like up in arms. No, we're proud. You're not proud. If you were proud, you wouldn't have let all these things happen. You wouldn't have let your country go to hell. You wouldn't let the entire culture become degraded in so many ways. You're not proud. So if you're going to be submissive like that, at least be submissive to the right thing, and then you can become something more and not just continue on a downward spiral. Just what is the Bhagavad Gita? The purpose of Bhagavad Gita is to deliver mankind from the nescience of material existence. Every man is in difficulty in so many ways, as Arjuna was in difficulty in having the, to fight the battle of Kurukshetra. Arjuna surrendered unto Sri Krishna, and consequently the Bhagavad Gita was spoken. Not only Arjuna, but every one of us is full of anxieties because of this material existence. Our very existence is in the atmosphere of non-existence. Actually, we are not meant to be threatened by non-existence. Our existence is eternal, but somehow or other we are put into asat. Asat refers to that which does not exist. So this is like the facade of, of modern life. Is that everyone's doing good. I mean, go on to Facebook. I mean, everyone is amazing. Everybody has no problem. You know, once in a while people talk about their problems. But the overall veneer of the social media and the whole thing that's happened with that. Although, you know, certainly these things have their place and their use. And I'm not saying people go on there and just spew out all their problems. But the whole, the whole idea is that it's just such an illusion that everything is fine. But we all feel inside of us that everything is not fine that there's so many difficulties we have to go through and just that existential question of you know I want to be eternal I can feel that I want my my relationships my life my everything to go on eternally but yet I know from experience of experiencing this world that that's not the way it is everything is everything is temporary things are constantly changing relationships are constantly changing and even ultimately we all have to face our death which this is why these are like the ultimate questions that we're dealing this isn't like uh you know this isn't like light stuff these are like the heavy questions that humans have dealt with for since since time immemorial And everything in our modern culture, of course, directs us away from these things. Everything become absorbed in the temporary, become, become absorbed in things that are basically non-existent. Everyone has some bizarre philosophy. People running around pretending to be gurus and masters of what knowledge it is they think they have. I'm not sure. But yet, they're going to be a guru. And then, you know, when they get a toothache, when they get this or that, then or they even, of course, people say they'll become God, that and that you could become God. But yet, when we get a toothache or something goes wrong with the body, immediately have to run to the dentist or beg for help from somebody. So that's not a God. But actually, there's no there's no loss in it because as we go through the teachings further, we'll see that the superior enjoying position. If you have a choice between God and the servant of God. The superior enjoying position is the servant of God. And that will become more clear as we go through the Vedic literatures. So don't be disappointed that you can't be God because the superior enjoying position is to be the servant or friend or relative of God. Out of so many human beings who are suffering, there are a few who are actually inquiring about their position as to what they are, why they are put into this awkward position, and so on. Unless one is awakened to this position of questioning his suffering, unless he realizes that he doesn't want suffering, but rather wants to make a solution of all sufferings, then one is not to be considered a perfect human being. Humanity begins when this sort of inquiry is awakened in one's mind. In the Brahma Sutra, the inquiry is called Brahma Jigasya, Every activity of the human being is to consider it a failure unless he inquires about the nature of the Absolute. Therefore, those who begin to question why they are suffering, or where they came from, or where they shall go after death, are proper students for understanding Bhagavad Gita. The sincere student should also have a firm respect for the Supreme Personality of Godhead, 
such a student was Arjuna. So this is giving us some clues as to what is the proper student to understand the Bhagavad Gita. And the main thing is that we can't be like an animal and think that you know there's no suffering or have no philosophy or no even the animals understand to a certain extent that they're suffering. They even have a philosophy of types, the way they interact with each other, the way they interact with nature. It's like it's like only like human beings now have become less than animals. We have no philosophy. We don't admit that we're in a suffering position. We don't inquire into how we can get out of the suffering position. So these things have been foisted on us by because these things are just natural to think about, to talk about, to want not not that you know every moment of your life is going to be consumed by you know how is it that I'm entrapped in non-existence when I'm eternal, and when I feel I'm eternal and all, but there has to be some part of your life that is dedicated to understanding these questions, the big questions, that even classical Western philosophy and art and literature dealt with. Plato and Socrates and the Greeks and the Romans and pretty much everyone up until the modern time saw this as the central focus of life, not just eat, drink, and be merry. This is only a modern phenomenon that we don't we don't examine the great mass of people don't examine the existential questions suffering uh, eternal life because we've been tricked into believing that there is no such thing as transcendence the whole the whole scientism science science was never meant to be a worldview it was meant to be a tool in the array of tools in gathering knowledge. Science is not a comprehensive worldview and you see this when they stray into the medical metaphysical questions of for of you know how is the creation of the universe, the creation of man. You see when they stray into the metaphysical questions it's a complete failure. For example for example I'll mention the big bang. The big bang theory actually is that everything came from nothing. And you can try to argue that if you want. Now, the latest book, I forget who it's by, that everything, he says that everything came from almost nothing. So, is almost nothing nothing, or is it something? So, it's something. Nothing is nothing, and all, so if something was already there, that had to be, that was, had to be created. Something can never come from nothing. Even a child can understand this. But because science wants to stray, because science is now is the state-sponsored religion, basically. A completely mechanistic, a completely materialistic view of the world. Mechanistic, materialistic, no mystery, nothing to be solved. We've got it all under control. No, you don't. Science is just the state-sponsored religion that's there to rubber stamp the designs and plans of the oligarchs. That's all it is. And these people that run around thinking that scientific science is a comprehensive worldview that they've adopted, it's so foolish. It was never meant to be that. And they only started doing that to control people, to get them away from understanding these questions because it's more easy to control people when they lack knowledge and they lack understanding. It's e just like it's easy, if you understand what an animal is, certain animal, if you want to train an animal, wh how they think, how they respond to cues, how they interact with the it's actually easy to train them. You have to first understand how they, how they sense the world, how they look at the world, how they react to the world. But once you do that, it's actually fairly easy to train them. So in the same way, if they can turn us animalistic, we're fairly easy to train. We're fairly easy to domesticate. Fairly, we're easy to control. So that's why the emphasis is on keeping us away from this study of transcendental literatures, transcendental life, and that is certainly seen in the modern religion of science that somehow it's leading us to some app what what exactly is the absolute truth of science 
I mean, the whole idea of science is that it's constantly changing, constantly being questioned, constantly has to be readjusted, that there is no eternal truth in it. All right, I'm going to stop there for now, but I've talked over for over an hour. And, uh, you know, so my idea is that I'm going to go through the parts of the Vedas that Prabhupada has given us as it is that have affected me the most over the years. It's all important. It's all needs to be looked at, but I know that I probably don't have time to look at it all. So I'm just going to try to go through the different parts of the Vedic literatures that I've have the most impact in my life and try to take people on a journey so that we can understand the true history of mankind and, and understand what our roots are understand that if we want to how we can I engage to become more aware of the transcendental subject matters I would like people to comment I would like people to interact um, I would like people if you have, if you would like to read parts of the parts of Prabhupada's books that are your favorite, and send them to me through my email at protectthecow at hotmail.com, then I can post those on uh, my YouTube channel. Um, I would like to see different things like this happen to try to develop a community of people who are discussing and delving into these issues beyond politics, beyond bodily identification beyond all the nonsense of division of modern life that they've created. I mean, they've created a lot of division. Man against woman, black against white. Good. Ugh. It's just unbelievable the amount of divisions that they've created nowadays. Anyway, I'm going to wrap it up there. I thank everyone for listening. And we will continue our discussion of the Bhagavad introduction to the Bhagavad Gita as it is and the lessons that we can learn therein. And I hope to continue further examining all, in a summary way, the parts of the Vedic literatures that have been made the most impression on me and the things that I think that I can speak on the best. And uh, I will thank you so much for listening. We'll talk next time. And I look forward to seeing you then. Okay, bye.